the Joe Rogan experience. The thing is, there is, if you look at the details, a fundamental difference between what Vladimir Putin is doing and what the United States is doing. Now, everybody is a victim of somebody's propaganda. Now, I talk to Russians, which is a very interesting thing. Both Russians and Ukrainians say that they are not at all under the influence of propaganda. Russians believe there's no propaganda in Russia. And Ukrainians believe there's no propaganda in Ukraine. That uh, from, from Russians think it's the West is influenced by their propaganda, by the CNNs and the Foxes, and Ukraine is influenced by their propaganda, by the limited number of news channels they have that are state controlled. Okay, from from our Western perspective, that seems ridiculous because it's obvious that Russia is un, uh, under influence of propaganda. But so it's hard to know what is true and not. But the reality seems to be that Russia is currently an authoritarian regime that tries to appear as much as possible as a democracy because there is an election yeah. and there's an extra hard truth on top of that. I don't know what to do with it, but Putin is still and even more so popular in Russia. He's very popular in India, in China, and in Russia and some small countries around former Soviet Union. What do you do with that? That's real um, objective, well, as far as we can tell, data from outside of, taken from outside of, polls taken from outside of Russia. Do you give any credence to the, the rumors that he has cancer? I, I, I'm not an investigative, you know, because there's a lot of sort of rumors of this nature. Oliver Stone even discussed it. He said yeah, that it was I, the case <laughs> while he was there. Yes, he said it very nonchalantly, and I thought that was a known fact. And then later I looked, and it was, you know, uh, I'm not sure that was objectively publicly known. But if Oliver said it, then perhaps there's some truth to it. He stayed there for quite a while when he was interviewing Putin. Yeah, two years. No, he visited multiple times, and he yeah. he spent time with them. Yeah, I, but uh, according to Oliver, he uh, he beat it. He beat the cancer. But, you know, he's 69 years old, so it's going to be yeah, 70. But beating the cancer when Oliver was there versus what he has now. Oh, what he has now? Yeah, because he looks like puffy, you know, which is oftentimes, uh, you know, I, I had, we were talking about this with the Chris Stefano podcast. Um, I had a friend who had gout, and they, they gave him prednisone. No, he had something else, too. Um, sarcoidosis. And they gave him prednisone, and his, like... His face got big. Yeah. And it's just like he looked puffy. And well, he said it's just a side effect of the steroids. Yeah, his face is puffy, you know? Yeah, Oliver Stone says Vladimir P Putin has struggled with cancer during his time in which the filmmaker focused on his work w on the Russian president, pictured above Putin waves during the Victory Day Parade, Red Square, May 9th. Yeah. Well, I'm much more, I'm much less of concerned about the puffiness of his face and more concerned about what's going on with, with his mind. That's it seems like he's too. a different man now than he was even a year ago. In, uh, what's, in what way? Um, so from this is what Oliver Stone commented on, and I agree. He's formed a much stricter information bubble around him, that there is uh, that isolation that a lot of us have experienced through COVID. I honestly think it might have to do with just the isolation due to COVID. Mm. You know, the, the basic distance you have to keep and all that kind of stuff as a as a political leader, you have to have extra precautions. Especially so, a political le leader that assassinates his enemies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that? Well, that, oh, yeah, that's that too. That's, well, no, but that, that, has, that, that was always the case. That has less to do with COVID. But don't you think that increases his paranoia? So, the, yes, like, the isolation. paranoia. Yeah. The paranoia is the thing, that's what gets dictators. That's what gets, you start mistrusting everybody, not just on the outside of the circle, but the inner circle. And so yeah. you don't know who to trust, even though the closest advisors, you don't know who to trust. So your flow of information is really flawed. Yeah. It's very limited. Yeah. And so you start, you start making really poor decisions, uh, even more so than before. And there, that that's where, I mean, if you, and I hate thinking of it that way, because to me, uh, the war in Ukraine is a, is a humanitarian thing not a geopolitics thing but if you think geopolitically invading ukraine was just a giant miscalculation 
on Putin's part on every level, geopolitical, social, militarily, um, unless there's there's very few scenarios in which this was calculated all along. The only scenarios of Putin thought through, um, first of all, maybe he thought that Zelensky would just back down, would just crumble under the pressure of even a minor invasion. And obviously, you have to give credit. This is really important. So uh, Ukraine got its independence for the first time in many centuries in 1991, 30 years ago, when the Soviet Union collapsed. So they're dealing with independence, with sovereignty, which is a difficult process, as the United States knows. We had a civil war about it. And the same, same thing in Ukraine. There's, there's factions. There's a lot of corruption. It's the second most corrupt country in, in Europe. Next, did you, next did you to see Russia. when uh, the New York Times was questioning Candace Owen on where is she getting her information that because the New York Times was trying to push this while the Ukraine invasion was happening. They were trying to push this thing that Ukraine was good and Russia is bad. And she was saying, well, this is a, one of the most corrupt countries on Earth. So they said to her, like, where are you getting this information? They sent her an email and she sent them back links to the New York Times and all these articles yeah. about how badly corrupt Ukraine was, which just makes me go, God damn, if I can't trust a fucking New York Times to get it right, like yeah. you're supposed to be the, the paper of note. But a lot has changed, though. So Zelensky, the president, he got into office with 70% approval, and before the war he had less than 30% approval. There was factions, there was divisions. The west side of Ukraine is pro, let's say, Ukrainian, and then the right side is pro-Russia. So he got into office, and he had a high approval rating, and then before the war it dropped very low? Yeah, it had been dropping gradually over because of the division, because of the factions. He wasn't able to bring the country together. And the war... He, turns out his great leadership uh, was catalyzed, was made possible. Like he was uh, sometimes sort of a catastrophe brings out the best in us. And that was the case with him. So w. He, George W. w. Bush. Yeah. yeah that, well, that's exactly what happened post 9-11. Yes. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, exactly. But in his case, I, he wasn't able to hold that for a long time. Let's see what Zelensky does. But at the moment... He was, Zelensky united a previously divided country, which is very difficult to do. So that, that, um, I mean, that's a historic event in, 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 um, for Ukraine in its sovereign history. And so in terms of corruption, that might be a really big blow to corruption, that mm. kind of unification. So, um, I think there's a fundamental difference between the corruption in Ukraine and the corruption in Russia. What is the conflict in Ukraine? The, the beside Russia, what is the internal conflict? Like the the factions. What are, what are, what do they want? What is a uh, what well, the, the dispute? Well, no, there's there's it's it's just factions that are uh, vying for power. That's just at the basic level. So it's basically like right versus left in America. Yeah, but, okay, so there's a bunch of differences, um, what they stand for, what they're looking for. A lot of it in the recent years has been centered around the war uh, with Russia, starting with 2014. And so some parts are Ukrainian-speaking, pro-Ukraine. Some parts are Russian-speaking or primarily Russian-speaking and, and pro-Russia. So in the east, you have the Donbass region, but around that as well, they want to be closer to Russia. And the, the west part wants to be closer to Europe, closer to NATO, closer to the European Union. Is that, That's one of the divisions. You want to be pro-democracy or you want to be pro-whatever the heck <laughs> Russia is. Yeah. So it's like, are you pulling towards the west, to, towards the west, the western civilization, or are you pulling towards the east? Um, the way of Russia, the way of China, the way of those superpowers. And I'm sure they're influenced, and they got have the the ones who are pro Russia. They're they're getting some signals from Putin or meeting with him, and he's giving them indications that they would best be served to be aligned with him and be better for them. And yeah, but he is still popular. He is the there's a. I mean, I don't know exactly why he's popular, but there's a longing as it, there is in a lot of nations to be the greatest nation on earth. Isn't there always just a longing for a strong man, like the strong man leader? 
I would say a strong vision, and that sometimes can coincide or often does with a strong man. Uh, like isn't it like a natural inclination that people have to be led by a strong man? Like Putin, like like him or hate him, think he's evil. Th- that's all good, but there's no doubt that he's strong. He's a strong leader. I mean, he's been running Russia for a long time, and in the way he's been doing that, sort of unopposed, in a ruthless manner, is very impressive. It's evil, but in terms of its efficacy, it's impressive what he's been able to do. I think strength is one of the things we admire in leaders, but it's yeah. not the entirety of it. Like, no. So that's why Zelensky is extremely popular. He stepped up, you know, the the famous thing. He was uh, Biden offered him a ride, and he said, "Fuck that, I'm staying put. Give me more bullets." And uh, he stayed in Kiev, Kiev, and held <laughs> held his ground where most leaders would have fled. Uh, this is the failure we had in Afghanistan, where we fled. Here's a leader that stepped up and held his ground, and that's rare in this world, and we admire that kind of strength, yes. And the same could be said by the Russian people, the Indian people, the Chinese people that admire strength in Putin. But we also admire other values that make this country great, the United States of America, is is this kind of respect for human freedom, Mm -hmm. human rights, and... um, I mean, sort of the embodiment of this ideal of like all men are created equal. Mm-hmm. That's not exactly communicated very clearly by by Vladimir Putin, right? Um, you know that's you know, <laughs> but and, and there's also a difference between and this again the Oliver Stone perspective is uh, between the messaging and the actual execution. You know, Hitler's messaging was also very sort of. Uh, beautiful sounding right what, mm-hmm. what is he talking about sort of uh national socialism respect for workers right like the the downtrodden workers um uh, that were uh, germany is a great nation that deserves to be respected among other nations and it was not respected because of world war one okay but like are you also going to mention that you're going to murder and imprison and torture people millions of people you're not, mm. you're not. And the same things with, with America, not moral equivalents at all, obviously. But we talk a lot about freedom. But what does freedom actually look like? You know, when we fight terrorism and evil in the world, what does that actually look like? Um, well, it turns out that it looks like you're bombing civilians, children, lose their fathers and mothers. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people, civilians die when you're spreading freedom all over the world. So we have to be very careful sort of separating the the messaging from the actions. And we have to, as, a, as Americans, make sure we live up to the ideal, and we don't always. And that, I think when you just paint the whole world as black and white, it's easy for us to say America good, China, Russia bad. Yeah. And, and instead of the, the full complexity of that, and that there's warmongers like that watch Ukraine now with the money that we're sending there and they get excited because they can escalate. And if they escalate, they can get more and more money for manufacturing weapons yeah. to both sides, to all sides. And what if China enters with Taiwan, that tension, that military conflict, and there's nukes on the ready everywhere. 